Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom. So here, 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 we're going to touch and address, address a few subject matters that have come up in the black consciousness community, especially by Garfield's new book. You know, Garfield's new book, we'd like to get a copy, so we're not going to address the book directly. We're not going to address the Garfield book directly because we haven't gotten to read the book or, you know, study and survey the book, see what it actually says. But he has given a lot of, um, you know, bits and bites here and there, namely on his channel, as well as on Sarnetta's platform. And those in our circle sometimes, you know, watch a lot of different things on the YouTubes, you know, black consciousness information on different black people, different things that are going on within our, you could say, the black community at home and abroad, you know, here and there. So I often get to get, get to hear kind of updates or hear parts or some things will be shared for me. Hey, check this out, check that out. Or have you heard this? Have you heard that? So this is where some of my response and questioning as well as response is going to come from. We're going to try to keep these responses topical. Now, yeah, I put this Garfield there because um, a few ones, you know, were saying, oh, Garfield this, Garfield that. And, you know, the name came up. And I thought about Garfield the cat, especially that feed me kind of a thing. And I think it's a very good thing he's doing by, you know, writing the book. Doesn't mean I agree with everything in his book, you know. I have not read the book, but from what he has quoted, he's quoted various sections. And he went through a whole, I think, a whole interview, right, which we got to see a good portion of. I think almost the majority of it. And other interviews on his own platform. You know, even before the book even came out, he was on the Sarnetta, you know, the couch and also on the, you know, the video chat and everything. And no, he doesn't look like this right here, but his name is kind of curious, Garfield, because he is the one, you know, going against the black Hebrews and black Hebrew Israelites. Now, this is not to defend every camp or every camp's doctrine or doctrinal themes, but the general, the general, um, we could say the general premise, the the general, the overview of what the black Hebrew Israelites, both the nowadays 70 AD, 70 AD, um, or 1970 AD, should we say, Israelites, the One West, you know, ISUPK and Hill Up, Captain Azania, we used to be on a, a radio platform, Ross Lawrence, uh, Brother Lawrence Davis, also Brother Yaniv of the African Israelites of Jerusalem, all on this platform and it's, it's available, you know, the What You Know About God and His Chosen People platform, What You Know About God, His Chosen People platform, you can check it out on the Anchor FM. Um, it's um, under Lawrence Davis, Lawrence Davis, Anchor FM, what you know about God and his chosen people. But here, 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 to address some of the Garfield, all right, we're going to feed this a little bit, you know, feed me, we're going to feed this a little bit. There's a couple of um, points that he has made concerning the Exodus, well, concerning the Bible generally. He is not, as he would say, a Bible believer. Um, he thinks that the Bible is not a book really for black people and he's been doing his best to present like evidence to back that up you know so he has written a book have a lot of scholarly academic um, um, references and, and resources which he calls his sources there from the consensus the, the consensus nowadays is a particular consensus amongst the scholars, scholarly people, even as he's mentioned, there's many people who are Bible believers, you know, there's many of these people who are Bible believers um, who have contributed to his book with the consensus that the Exodus never happened, right? That the Exodus never happened. And Chronicles, Chronicles in the Bible is one particular book that he uses and has used in his book and has shared various highlights, you know, sections of the book and chapters, parts of chapters of the book, which he feels makes his point. He believes these these points are valid and are made by the consensus of the academic, the scholarly, also the archaeological, some of the archaeological finds that seems to be the popular consensus nowadays you know that the exodus never happened the exodus in the bible and therefore if there was no exodus then there's no religion and he says that the hebrews also never existed 
in the time period of the Exodus. So he says the Exodus never happened. And the Hebrews, spoken of in the Bible, in the, the Torah, right, and what one's referred to as the Tanakh, that they never existed at this time. He feels that, you know, he feels, say, and his belief, it's his belief, it's still a belief, even if it's backed up by a, quote, consensus of opinion of certain latter-day scholars, some of them even Bible believers, coming from, some say, a Christian, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christian perspective, he feels, say, that these are valid points, and he has done us all, I say, a favor, in a sense, by putting them all in the book, backing up his book, saying his book is right and exact, and even in one particular interview, he said that even some of his Rasta and Rastafari brothers are going to be upset with him, you know, when they, um, you know, when they see this book, even he mentioned that I think he has a cousin or someone who has just gone to Ethiopia. And he says that Ethiopia and Cush is not the Ethiopia and Cush, you know, of the Bible or history. So he says that that cousin of his who has just gone to Ethiopia, I don't know whether to live for a, a time or whether to live more permanently or just to visit or, but he said that that cousin who has gone to Ethiopia and has believed some of the things that she has heard about Ethiopia or read or studied is going to be upset as well. And he's somewhat, um, somewhat facetious on a certain level, but like apologetic that all these people are going to be upset with me. It's like he kind of wants that attention on what he's doing. That's what brought to mind the Garfield, you know, the Garfield, the cat, feed me kind of that sense of feed me. You know, it's interesting how names, you know, how names are. But this is not an ad hominem. First of all, ones might think so from the beginning of the video, we had some Garfield, the cat, so forth and so on. And ones might think it's an ad hominem. Ad hominem means like you're attacking a man. A man has said such and such, and instead of getting into what he has said, and maybe attack his information or disinformation, one is attacking him. We're not going to go there, but he, at the same time, him and Sarnetta, has attacked... Um, you know, the Hebrews, the Israelites, you know, what they believe, their God, their Bible, you know. And that is an attack on all of us. And it's interesting how Garfield, he mentioned the Rastas and the Rastafari, some of his Jamaican brothers who happen to be Rasta or Rastafari, are also not going to like what he is saying. But he believes that this that he has written and put together with the backing of certain academic and scholarly and archaeological um, references and resource are reliable. He feels that this consensus opinion, he said it even on the Sarnetta, on a recent Sarnetta um, 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 broadcast um, on the YouTubes, that if the consensus is this, whatever the consensus is, because he asked the question about Jesus, whether Jesus Christ existed, he said, well, not the character that's in the Bible for all the miracles and everything else like that, but he does believe there was some historical person named either Jesus Christ or we know him as Yeshua HaMoshia did exist, but not quite like the narrative or story that's in the New Testament of the Bible. And he says, he backs it up by saying, it's not his own opinion so much, but this because what the consensus of scholarly research is. So he basically goes with the scholarly research. So if the scholarly research at this time, you know, and there's a lot of scholars out there, but of course people say, well, this is all the scholars, the scholars. But what about other scholars that are out there? You know, and what is a scholar? What is the academic opinion? This is not the platform here or the vlog the video here for us to address that in full but just a, a question just to put on the beamer so to speak what is you know what does academic really mean what does scholarly really mean in the sense why if one is a quote academic end quote or a quote scholar end quote or an archaeologist quote end quote why is their opinion much more than someone else who might have done research, right? It's not monolingual, right? Because many of these scholars are monolingual, right? That means they only know one language, English, so they're researching a lot of things in English because a lot of reference, points of reference that we've had to go through in different languages, not just mentioning the Hebrew, also in Amharic and Ge'ez. We've gone into those particular studies, sometimes had to go into, you know, um, reference books like in French, right? In the early days, there were French books. Some of you know, our French was not very strong, so we had to rely on some ICN, 
you know, ICN, you know, some of our brothers and, and sisters, Haitian brothers and sisters who helped us with the French to understand certain things about Ethiopia, some very good documents written back in the days that had information, detailed information that we don't really find anywhere else in the English speaking world, sometimes German books. We've gone also into German books, also Italian books as well, right? On Ethiopia, on Hebrew, and on those areas of study. Also with Rastafari and Haile Selassie have gone into many different, you know, um, um, multilingual kind of resources. Some of these resources we can understand and we understand firsthand because we have that uh, linguistic ability in some of the languages, right? Other things we have to rely on others that we trust, that we have faith in and we trust their translations, interpretation to give us more insight. Now I'm kind of mentioning all this right here as a kind of a, a 411 overview, but there are a few topical themes. Instead of like clouding it as they do like on the Sarnetta platform, sometimes they have a debate about one thing or they're discussing one thing and a lot of things come in and two people are going back and forth and then Sarnetta is, is, is his platform. So he's jumping in and sometimes it seems as though he's partial on this side or that, but he does make some good points. He does make some very good points. And one of them is concerning ad hominem, like attacking a man, attacking a person. There was a JJ7000 um, and Nepal, right? A sister named Nepal, who um, were debating about rape in the Bible. That was another video that we was going to touch on about rape. You know, this accusation, um, a neo-feminist kind of accusation, though she says she's not a feminist. And some of the Hebrews and Israelites out there in the various different camps and groups and individuals, you know, have done, I guess, a plethora of videos to kind of insult her or to, you know, call her Jezebel or a whore or this or that. And there was only one, I think it was um, brother, brother Michael, um, Michael Edwards. I think he was one of the few people that actually had went on the air and did a video and said that they were all wrong for that. Right? And Sarnetta would say, well, you know, if you believe, you know, that these Hebrews, man, these Hebrews or Israelites don't even believe in their God and don't even keep to a certain level of biblical scriptural decorum that one would think that one who is a believer in the Bible and a Hebrew and Israelite should. And one West, you know, wouldn't do that, you know, as, as they say, and, and, and no doubt. And from having these dialogues over a year, two or so with um, one of the captains, Captain Azania of the ISUPK, you know, we found it to be a very fruitful, rewarding. We've agreed on a lot of things as being Israelites. We consider ourselves more Israelites of Ethiopia connection, you know, and they might not embrace, don't embrace the Ethiopia and the Haile Selassie aspects. But when getting into the Bible and we black people, black and brown people over here, identifying ourselves as Israelites, we do have a lot of correspondence of what we accept and what we um, know is the truth, right? So that there was very beneficial. That's why I mentioned that early on. But let's touch on the Exodus. This is basically about whether the Exodus ever happened. So there's a couple of questions that have come up from our listening to some of the interviews and the dialogue that we have sought to note in fact sometimes we just keep mental notes but it's important a lot of times you know you know um to write right you know because john teach us by writing that which we may have never known it's very good to write and take notes of things right take note of a question okay the first note that we have right here is garfield book to get a copy just to remind ourselves we spoke about this earlier on finite sister wife and a few others among the Chabarim and here we share this right here and this is not because we support his book so much but because his book seems to be something that's a lightning rod right now and we have to read it for ourselves but from the excerpts that he has given we seek to address the excerpts that he has given and some of that which he has presented this both on his own platform on the YouTube and his, I think he has Brother Garfield University and all of that, and elsewhere, even on the Black Consciousness, Black News 102, or I think Sarnetta's, Sarnetta, the news, the platform that he has on the YouTubes as well. So the first thing is concerning the Exodus never happened. All right, so let's address, let's address the Exodus, all right? And, well, I'm not a Jamaican, 
in that sense. I'm not a Benjamite. I'm a Yehuda, right? a Judahite, or so-called North American, you know, Negro, a Black American, as ones would say. But I am Ras Tafari. I am Ras Iadonis Tafari, the Prime Minister of the Lion of Judah Society. Now, ones might try to play with that name, because we see they done that with they done did that with Zion Lex, right? Zion Lex. They call him Lion Lex. Lion Lex playing around with his name. Now, I know there's some back and forth between Garfield and Zion Lex, right? And that's not really our you know business or forte so to say, but when you're attacking my fellow um, Yehudi and black Jew, you know, black Jewish brother, you know, Yehudi brother, I think um, Zion Lex's father was Rastafari, Rastafari, so I'm sorry, even though he might not agree with certain things concerning Rastafari doctrine or teaching, you know, we take that a little bit more personally. It's like when Sarnetta would, you know, circle the wagons for the people that he you know, promotes or he agrees with those who have su supported his platform, you know, on and on, year in and year out. You know, those are his people, those are his family. Even if he disagrees with them or calls them out, they're still his family. And we've done old videos, of course, he took down some of the different sites where some of our old videos were, where we, you know, questioned certain things concerning, you know, different ones, Zion, Lex, so forth and so on, while still expressing our you know, commonality, you know, there is a certain commonality as well as agreeing with some of the research, a lot of the research that he's been doing recently, speaking about Brother Zion Lex, we have shared that with our own group, you know, and even this will reach others, hopefully, within our circle, right, to say, check out Brother Zion Lex, he's from the, we say, the black Jews of Harlem, those who have remained within the, the cipher you know, or the um, the the black Jew identification, the Yehudi Jews, right? They view themselves as Jews, black Jews, the commandment keepers, you know, the congregation of the living God, the commandment keepers, the congregation of the living God, that particular community that that um, dates and emanates from the time of um, Rabbi um, Wentworth Arthur Matthew, right? And that is also a common point, right? Being a black American and from the North Country, this North Country, these are ones who are very instrumental up here, but seeing how even those who have come from the, you know, the Caribbean or, or Yard or Jamaica also have been on the same level. We recognize we are family, but there is different tribes. There are different tribes. In my father's house, there are many mansions. I know I'm quoting a biblical thing, but we are one that you could call uh, one who does yay and amen, you know, the scripture. Now, this doesn't mean that we yay and amen every translation because we're not monolingual, right, in that sense, that we study to shew ourselves approved. So now, the Exodus in the Bible, did the Exodus happen? From our study, from our research, and this is not from our faith, from a faith-based perspective, from a faith-based perspective, we will say, yay, yay, amen, 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 amen. We'll say, yay, and amen. From a faith perspective, they'll say Bible believer. We, we don't really ascribe to that particular um, nomenclature, phraseology, but from a faith-based perspective, we will say yes. But now, from a more scholarly, academic, a, a studious, a study to shoot ourselves approved, from the evidence that we have come across and from reliable resources and references that have presented evidence and documentation, right, and logical, rational reasoning that is based on evidence and documentation, we will say that, of course, yes, it existed. Yes, it existed. Some say, well, if the Exodus existed, why didn't the Egyptians talk about it? So I ask you this question. When we talk about black people in the Americas, particularly, Right? And all that we have done, all that we have contributed for the good of this, generally speaking, this society or for the good of this country right, in America. How long has it been? It still goes on right now where many of our ancestors and those who have done good and those who have discovered things, those who have been inventors. And a lot of things have been suppressed about the good that black people in the Americas have done from the history books. Uh, the history books have been twisted up to um, minimize, marginalize, 
or just to um, what they would call it again um, um, to um, um, what's it called when you like black out things you know they, they black out you know things in, in books and everything you know what I mean um, to um, there's a phrase I'm not thinking of the phrase now some of you probably know it but a lot has been done to not speak the truth about what black people have done in America just the history of black people in America and it was black people in America going back to we have some old books that we have republished from going back to I think some of the oldest books one of the oldest books probably in the western gentile world is like 1600 and something out of England the next one is like 1700 and something just a book that I can recall right now. I think Light and Truth is that particular book by like the Colored Man Society, the Colored Society of Colored Men or something like that. That's the phrase they was using to refer to black men. And this book is just an amazing book, right? Just the amount of um, research that was done, seeing the available references that were available to them in those days. Because now we have the internet, the World Wide Web, and a lot of things we can search easily and get various, um, you know, various um, information, redacted. I was thinking about redacted. Much of our history had been redacted, right? So the available knowledge in the past to see many of our scholars. So this process of writing books where our own people speaking, generally speaking as black people, black and brown people, would write books to basically expose or highlight or emphasize things that our own people have done because the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, the WASP media and academia and the scholarly sources and the universities and all of that have chosen to suppress that. So a lot of our history has been suppressed here in the Americas. So we can ask the question when you say, well, if the Exodus happened, why the Egyptians didn't talk about it? Because it's, it's a principle and a policy in the ancient world that you, you try to mitigate or minimize, lessen or minimize what your enemies have done, and you try to maximize what you have done, right? It's like, I think it was Ramses, Ramesses. I think he did this as well, where there was a battle, some called the Battle of Kadesh, right? There was a whole battle that went on, and historians have thought that he won that particular battle when they had come across the monuments in ancient Egypt, and then when they did more diligent research, both in the Levant, you know, the state of Israel and that particular land over there, Palestine, as it's called, and also in Syria and other places, they found corresponding references that... Ramesses, if it was Ramesses, I think it was Ramesses, that he really didn't win that. He, he, he didn't win that in the way that he portrayed it to his own people. It's like America. America goes in another part of the world and they fight somebody. Like we only know that the Americans lost in Vietnam because all that was televised. That they was televising that so people could see what was going on because it was televised in spite of what they were saying. People saw the evidence that America is not winning that war over in Vietnam and even the government leaders had to kind of admit and they had to pull out. So his history has to testify and would testify because the evidence right, was able to be disseminated and circulated broadly. But in the ancient world, right, in the ancient world, if they lost a battle, not if, but basically Ramesses at best, it was a truce. At best, it was a truce. They came to some sort of a compromise. I think they either married, you know, they took like, like something they would take wives, you know, like I take a wife from your people, you take a woman from my people, and this is the way maybe it might be some woman who's my daughter or your daughter and so forth and so on, and we make that sort of agreement to be like more like family. So we can say, well, you know, now you are like family. You're like my, you're not my enemy anymore, but you're like my brother-in-law. We've had bad times in the past, but now it's on the men. That's basically what was done, but actual battlefield evidence proves that the Egyptians, the, the B'nai Mitzri, Mitzrayim, they did very poorly, or they did bad. They did not win it the way that Ramesses, if that's the correct one right there, Ramesses, the way he portrayed it on the monuments. I'm just giving this as a point of reference. So there, if in a battle that actually occurred, that's historically... Um, provable by a variety of different overlapping historical facts, if Ramesses, the Egyptian, did not win this, 
But then he told his people, he made big monuments, memorial stellas and all of this, you know, wall paintings, all of that to basically talk about how glorious, you know, it was and how the gods was on his side. And he made his figure on the wall paintings, uh, the engravings and so forth and so on, so much larger than the enemy and, and how he was like a big giant and they were little midgets, they were little small men. He was basically boasting. And them hark we call like fukara. Uh, you know, fukara. It's like it's like it's it's like boasting, like like war boasting. You know, it's like we listen to rap or hip hop, some hip hop and other sort of musics. And sometimes, man, man, me, me, a bad man, me, the baddest man, the baddest man you ever did see. We lick dozens of shots, not dozens of shots. We lick multiple shots, and we just kill everybody. You know what I mean? Because we're just so good, we're so lovely, so forth and so on. You know, that right there is just like you know. You know what that is, right there. That's not historical. So, but people took what what Ramesses and and the wall paintings and the monuments, which said that Egypt won that battle. Then they found out at best it was a truce and a compromise, right? Because the um, who was it? The Hittite, the Chet, the Cheti, the Cheti, the Cheti, the Bene Cheti, the Hittites. They had more. Um, they had chariots. Their chariots were like more developed. You know what I mean? Like technology was even in the past. You know, so the Egyptians were working with the same old chariots that were probably good in a more ancient time, but the Hittites had developed better technology, right? And their chariots were better. You know, like their tanks were better than the Egyptian tanks, so to speak, speaking about the chariots. And you know, the, the Egyptians suffered a lot of loss. They were still fighting. They did not just run off the battlefield like the later Egyptians did with the state of Israel, like that happened back then, you know, back in the 60s. But, you know, back in this ancient time, the Egyptians were still fighting, but they were losing. It was, it was a loss, right? So instead they sued for peace, right? But that aspect of the peace treaty, that truce and peace treaty, that was drawn up was not what was represented on the wall paintings and the monuments. So that means that an exodus, what the exodus represents from the Hebrew, the biblical narrative, would not be the same thing the Egyptians would, would be saying. In fact, haven't you known of times when somebody loses a battle, you know, loses a war, loses a battle, and they don't say nothing about it. There's many times people have loss of a fight or loss of battle or something like that, right? Um, and, and they don't talk about it. People tend not to talk about their losses, especially great civilizations, civilizations that are known for victories, that have a lot of pride to upkeep. So it's, it's, it's a very logical reason why the Egyptians, right, would almost say nothing about it. In fact, the time period of the Exodus that we find to be the proper time period is in the time of Tutmos III, right? And even um, Hatshepsut, we see how Shepsut to be that daughter of Pharaoh based on the evidence from archaeology in ancient Egypt and based on also a, a linguistic study of the Bible, not just a translation, but the linguistic study of the Bible that Hatshepsut, right? which was like the stepmother, so to speak, of Tutmos III. They had a really kind of complicated, you know, like um, relationship, you know, how they did things back then, right? But um, when Tutmos III came to power, right, and he is sometimes called by Western Gentile scholars to be the Napoleon. They call him the Napoleon of ancient Egypt. Really, Napoleon should be called the Tutmos uh, the third of France, if anything, but you know how the Europeans do, so forth and so on. And that kind of goes to prove my point right there. You know, they'll flip it around, even though Tutmos the third was before Napoleon. So if anything, you should compare Napoleon to Tutmos the third, not Tutmos the third to Napoleon. But anyway, be that as it may, when Tutmos the third finally came to power, Right in ancient Egypt, it is a known fact that he destroyed, he decimated the legacy of his sister slash mother Hatshepsut, who we regard to be that that um, daughter of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. 
right, according to the biblical narrative. He destroyed it. This is, there's proof positive that he destroyed a lot of her monuments. In fact, they didn't find a lot of her things until they did further studies and, and digging up archaeology and found that what Tutmos III did because he, he so despised his sister mother. And you have to ask, why would he despise his sister mother who was a former ruler of ancient Mitzrayim, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, ancient Gibbets? Why would he so despise her that he would destroy her memorial and her legacy? I don't even think that the, her body was even found. Who knows what he did with her crypt and, and, and her body, you know what I mean? So that kind of hatred that was in the, in the royal and ruling house of ancient Egypt that was displayed by Tut Tutmos to Hutmose, right? Tutmos III, right, against the former ruler who happened to be his sister and also his stepmother makes you think like, well, wait, wait, hold on for a moment. Why would they do this to each other? Why would he take great stones that were part of her buildings that was built to dedicate and to memorialize her works and, and turn them around? Like where she had her writing on one side, right? And defacing. History shows that he defaced a lot of her monuments, a lot of her the engravings that were on stone, took other large stones, turned them around, and reused them to write his stuff on there. You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying that ancient Egypt, yes, ancient Egypt has a long-standing culture, and there's a lot of things that we can learn about the history of the ancient world from ancient Egypt. Right? But in the case of the Hebrews and the Israelites and the children of Israel, ancient Egypt on the overt cannot always be reliable to say, well, the Exodus didn't happen because the Exodus did happen. Ancient Egypt would have wrote about it. That means if you're a scholar of ancient Egypt, you don't really know ancient Egypt the way you claim to know ancient Egypt. Because ancient Egypt, like many other cultures and everything, even these latter-day rulers, Gentiles, even with us black people in America, how often we complain that, you know, what about our, the part that we played in the War of Independence? I mean, we hear black scholars pointing out hidden and suppressed facts that they had to do with diligent research, really dig up things and and sometimes even had to speculate where the evidence was destroyed or not found that black people played an important role in the America. Buffalo soldier in the heart of America, right? Back in those days and times, the War of Independence from England, the Civil War later on, and a lot of what was done back in the Independence War by black people, even the whole Paul Revere and the, the British are coming and and, and who was the real one that really said what they said is just coming out lately. And a lot of the academic scholarship is forced to acknowledge it because ones who were not considered to be scholars and academics and, 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 and collegiate researchers did collegiate academic scholarly works that brought so much proof to the forefront that they had to um, um, acknowledge it, you know, not willingly, you could say unwillingly, but they had to acknowledge, yes, oh wow, black people did do a lot of stuff then. How come this was not? It must have been the racism. It was the racism, it was generational, academic, scholarly racism. So what I submit to you is that ones have sought to change the narrative of ancient biblical scholarship since circa 1948 since 1948. This goes to a couple of points that we would like to bring out. This is already a little bit longer video, but let this be maybe the opening reasonment. This is like the opening reasonment of where we're seeking to go because each of these subject matters that we are seeking to address and bring facts to the fore, to the forefront, right? Like, like the whole Israelites, the whole point about the Israelites. Israelites are not Canaanites. There is a minority consensus, and even some of the white Jews and out in the state of Israel are saying this too. There's a very important reason why they're saying Israelites are Canaanites, because the Canaanites are Indo-European people. In other words, what we're saying is that white people come from the ancient Canaanites, who come from the Hamites or the Kamites, right? And there's proof of this. 
there's, there's, there's a lot of proof of this, not just the proof that we provide, but we provide the proof that we have. And then we also highlight other proof. We were surprised. I don't know if this sister is still out there. Right? When I say sister, you know, this, this woman is still out there. She's called herself Phoenician goddess, Phoenician goddess. And she's an Indo-European woman. Uh, uh, can I say white woman? It's like the woman in the Bible that's called the Syrian Phoenician woman. In the Gospels, she's called the Syrian Phoenician woman in one Gospel. And in the other Gospel, she's identified, um, I think, either as a, um, as a Greek woman and might be even identified as a Canaanite woman. That, that's very interesting right there because that kind of tells us that what is testified there and what others who claim to be descendants of the Canaanites, many Indo-European nations, like Turkey. Hit, the Hittites were from Turkey, the modern day Turkey. Those were the Hittites, the children of Het, of Heth, right? Or the Kitti, they call them the Kitti, the Kitti, the Kitti people, right? They trace their roots to the Canaanites. And although we may look at them today and say, well, aren't the Hamites black people? Well, how come the Canaanites look like either white people or Indo-European kind of people, more so-called white, you know, and straighter here than, than melanated and kinky curly here? Well, you know about recessive genes. Recessive genes. This is science. Science speaks about recessive genes. And science and many scientists have gone through the DNA research and there's much facts that basically prove that white people as we know them are fairly new. When I say fairly new in the sense of the genetic, um, the genetic um, not modifications, but the genetic um, differences that have created them or caused them to be the way they appear or they are on the outer view should not dismiss that their root and their origin was black people. In other words, white people come out of black people. And so the Canaanites are not Israelites. The Canaanites are Indo-European people. So these are some of the main points that we find from listening to a few of Garfield's, um, you know, some of the interviews and some of his presentation. There's a couple of points he goes over and over and he also sometimes and has quoted areas of his book from this chapter, that chapter, the next chapter. This is why we like to get the book more in full. As well as to follow up. Now, having academic resources and references, I guess it'd be good to see the book for ourselves. We can't speak to that. And we're not going to speak to that. But what we can speak to is concerning the Exodus. The Exodus, he says the Exodus never happened. Now, the Exodus... Remember, we're reading a translation. I know a lot of folks don't want to hear this, the Sardinettes, the rest of them, just what's in the Bible. They feel that the KJV Bible is the Bible. They don't even want to go to the Hebrew because this is where they have a handicap. They are handicapped by being monolingual scholars. Monolingual scholar truly is not a real scholar. Even back in the past when scholarship among the Europeans became a big thing, it was necessary and important for them to learn other languages. You know, Latin, other sort of languages. We find that a lot of latter-day, nowadays, scholars among, especially the European, but even among some of our people, um, lack that ability to go into other languages. So we're reading a translation, or we're reading a bunch of translations, right? And anybody who knows about linguistics and translations, you know that sometimes when you're translating, you're seeing something in the language, whatever language it is, and you're seeking to make a translation, say, into English, because of how the English language is, there's a lot of um, choice and options you could make and you have to make, depends on who you're talking to and what point you're seeking to bring across. In fact, we find that other languages are more direct in what they are saying. I mean, if you have that gift of tongues, you know, other languages are more direct in what they are saying. But the, the translations oftentimes leave a lot to be desired. And we have to say this about the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Version of the Bible, I think, is a, is a classic example, you know, of what we mean, that the King James Version of the Bible structurally, structurally is good. 
structurally, that means how they laid out the chapters and the verses and what's said in the verses. If you go into the Hebrew of the Old Testament or certain parts of the Aramaic, if you go into the Septuagint, you know, in the New Testament or even in the Old Testament, you can see how there is that relationship, how certain things got translated the way they got translated. But let's address this whole thing about the Exodus. Because we're going to still call this video the Exodus, right? Because you're going to have to come out of Egypt, right? You all got to come out of Egypt one way or the other, right? Got to come out of Egypt, right? When I say come out of Egypt, because most of these ones, even Garfield and the rest of them, they're trying to back up a particular premise. They're starting out with a certain premise. What I like to do is when I hear something said, I like to hear the ones and ones out. I wasn't always like this, but over time developed this sort of discipline. Right, so if we have a debate or have a disagreement with someone, you know, we try to really uh, not be ruled by our emotions. We try to take emotions out of the equation. Why? Because as many well know, emotions cloud judgment. You know, we're not into feel say. Like we don't want to say what we feel or feel what we say in that sense because sometimes that clouds what is right sometimes we have to admit that listen i don't agree with this guy right here but he is absolutely right like i was listening to sarnetta and garfield talking and sarnetta made a statement at first i said something concerning sarnetta you know sarnetta is like this and like this and like this and then as he continued he said something and i said to those around i said you know what i agree with what he says here what he's saying right here is correct Somebody say, well, do you disagree with him? I disagree with him on this point. I disagree with him on that point. But on this point, I agree with him. A lot of folks cannot do that because of the whole feel set, right? And feel out softly, philosophy. They, they feel out softly, right? And because their emotions, you know, they bring emotions into the equation, right? And the emotions, they cloud proper discernment, right? Because sometimes it's better that you acknowledge what your opposition is saying that is true, you acknowledge the truth of that matter without feelings and emotions to cloud and get mixed up moods and attitudes. And many times I've been able to defeat the main argument that still I know is not true and I have evidence to back it up by not getting caught up on feel say, not getting caught up on emotions. I, you know, how I feel about it. Okay, say something. They say, oh, the Bible is all fictitious and everybody in the Bible is fictitious. all made up. Moses never existed. Exodus never existed. You know, a lot of so-called religious people or Bible-believing people, Garfield is correct with that. They would get very upset about it. They would, oh, man, they would get very upset about that. And so I can understand how his book is, like I said, like a lightning rod, you know, maybe causing a firestorm among many ones and ones. And a lot of the black Hebrew Israelites really don't know how to respond to it. If some of their people get that book and they read in that book and they say, well, look, um, the Exodus never happened. I was reading this chapter here and seeing the, the, the evidence, you know, that Garfield is presenting from these academic and scholarly and archaeological um, um, resources. You see the argument he's making, and you know ones are going to respond probably with ad hominem, you know, insult. You know, like you know the way that some of the Israelites responded to Nepal. You know, and Michael Edwards is one of the few, according to Sarnetta, that basically that was wrong, calling her a whore, uh, you know, a bitch, uh, you know, Jezebel, and so forth and so on. And, and when you do that, you're playing in two people's hands because the audience listening to you might not be on the Hebrew Israelite side of things, right? They might be more hoping that the other person proves their point. And you might begin off making some good points. And then somebody says something like, all oh, that is fake. What you're talking about is fake. It never existed. It's like Santa Claus. It's like Easter egg, bunny rabbit. And you get so offended that you now start to call them out of their name, talk about their mama, talk about their children, talk about their family, talk about everything else instead of the point. Now... You know, thinking about that, some might say, well, Ross, Yadin, you know, this is this video right here is supposed to be about whether the Exodus ever happened. Did the Exodus ever happen? What we call the Exodus 
according to the best information from a from a faith-based perspective I would say yes but then that is just from a faith-based perspective from a academic perspective you know what I mean when we say from an academic perspective and from a studied and evidence perspective there is a lot of evidence that says yes it did happen and yes the biblical narrative is correct now so the translation may leave a lot to be desired when you're reading something in the King James Version and then you really have the spirit of truth to discern and read the, um, the Hebrew right and you study the Hebrew and you read the Hebrew in a learned and uh, informed way because a lot of people might just go to like the the strong concordance that's not really reading the Hebrew that's basically understanding words in their general relationship to other words right there's a whole discipline and that's the thing that we start out with discipleship the Rastafari the discipleship discipleship radio Rastafari sabbatical podcast you know and start to go into the Torah portions the uh, the sabbatical studies you know, and that has really helped many of us to clarify things that we thought were correct or thought were true by understanding the, the, the context, like the supertext, right? You know, the subtext, first of all, is the verses. And then understanding the context that that verse is put in. And then also understanding the supertext of the whole chapter or the whole book to put things into proper context. Now, concerning Exodus, let's touch on this word Exodus. And the word Exodus is an a interesting word because the word Exodus, I'm going to say this on the record, maybe we'll do an, a separate video, it'll be a shorter video just to that, this particular point. So we'll go over this and add a little bit more to it. The word Exodus does not exist in the text of the Bible. Did you know that? Did you know that? That is something that we never really kind of thought about. We knew that we have the second book of Moshe, the Hebrew book that is called Shemot, Exodus, right? And Exodus basically means going out. The word Exodus means going out. And the word Exodus coming from the Greek word exodus, exo, exodus, exodus. That's the word in the coin of Greek, exodus. It was coined by the ancient Greeks. We say it was coined by the ancient Hebrews that were speaking Greek according to the, the popular narrative, you know, concerning how the LXX, the Septuagint Bible, came about. So it was coined in the Greek language when they translated the title of Moses' second scroll, the second scroll of the Torah. And yes, we're going to address um, who wrote the Torah did Moses write the Torah? Did he write everything in the Torah? Did he write part of the Torah? What part did he write about his own death in the Torah? You know, that's one of the questions that a lot of atheists have put out there and has stumbled a lot of folks, right? Because they are more approaching it from the feeling and emotion of a Bible believer, right? And not really looking at, okay, the question there is a valid question. And though it might seem that those who are using this valid question are using this valid question to dismiss your faith, you can sustain and support your faith by dealing with the fact as is and not get caught up on the feelings and emotions. So in translate the second scroll of the Torah, the second scroll of the Torah was called the Sefer Yetziat Mitzrayim. The Sefer Yetziat Mitzrayim. The book of the going out from Egypt. That's what the second scroll of Moshe, known as Exodus. Now we know it as Exodus because it's found so translated in the King James Version, 1611, the 400 year Bible. That's the title of it Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So the second book, Exodus, is basically a transliteration uh, of the Greek. It's actually a Greek word. Exodus is a Greek word because the Torah or the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek right during the latter part of the 
of the BC time. Now we can get into exact dates and everything like that, but this is to give one's an overview. How do we get the name Exodus? And it's only found in the Bible as a name of the second book. So if you look up in a um, in a um, Bible search software, you know, we have some of this on our phones. If we look up in the Bible search software, let's do this right here, right? In the Bible search software. Where's the Bible search software? So let's go right there. Okay, there we're kind of, we're kind of revealing our card right there, right? But you saw that. We'll return to that. Exodus. So here we have Exodus. Look, Exodus doesn't show up one time. Exodus does not, because this here searches the text. Not the titles of the book, but the text. So there's nowhere in the 66 books of the Bible where Exodus appears. Now, of course, we say, what? Exodus is not even the Bible. It's only the name of the second book. Yes. But what, how and why? Now, scholars who, who, who are any, what scholars of the Bible should be able to say the same thing. Exodus was coined in the ancient Greek when they translated the title of Moses' second book or the second book of the Torah, the Sefer Yetziat Mitzrayi. Sefer is book. Yetziat means going out. Yetziat. Yetziat means going out. Mi Mitzrayim. Mi Mitzrayim. From Mitzrayim. From Mizrayim. Right? Later, the Greek, the Greek, this, this Greek was adopted as the English. Right? Later, this Greek was adopted as the English. For example, let's put on, let's, let, let's, let's put out of, out of Egypt. Right? Out of Egypt. When we look at out of Egypt, Notice this right here. This is a particular phrase, right? Right. Out of Egypt, out of Egypt, right here. Notice it goes to Chronicles. This is a book that um, that um, Garfield, you know, has said that a lot of his book focuses on the narrative in Chronicles to disprove the Exodus account and to prove, he says, that the Exodus never happened, right? And he says something, he says the Exodus is not mentioned in Chronicles. Here's where we have caught him in, a, in, in an error. We'll say it's an error, some might, might be able to call it a lie, right? A lie. He says that Exodus, you know, and he has a lot of videos out there and we've tried to save these particular videos in case ones might say later on, no, no, I didn't say that. We'll be able to go to, as they say, proverbially speaking, the videotape. Notice right here. Here it says, plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. Right? And slew him with his own spear. Right? Now that's out of the Egyptian's hand. That's not Exodus right there. But boom. Here in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, 21. Now, 1 Chronicles is a book written by the return Yehudi, the return um, Judahites, Judeans, those who returned from the tribe of Judah after like 70 years from the Babylonian, you know, captivity. There was a remnant that returned during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So after that, they looked at their history and they wrote a chronicle. So Chronicles is a much later book. So yes, Chronicles has a lot of very interesting things in it, but you have to also know what the, um, what they call it, what the providence, what is the providence of Chronicles? You use these academic and, and these terminology, what's the providence? In other words, um, what's the chain of custody? Where does, what does Chronicles represent? Who wrote Chronicles, right? And it's known and accepted that Chronicles was written by the returned Judeans, we say the black Jews of Babylon who had returned to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem as well as the temple and to rebuild the, you could say, the religious, you know, life, the spiritual and religious life of, of Judah, you know, to like restore, reboot Judah when the Judeans returned. And that was because the edict of, um, of, of Koresh, of, of Cyrus. And we have that biblically, and, and that's also historically known, you know, to be a fact right there. But let's look at this verse right here, because Garfield says, he says that the Exodus is not even mentioned or spoken about in Chronicles, right? And he says that the people never came out of anywhere 
because they always were in the land. And he goes on to say that the Israelites are not Hebrews. They're basically are Canaanites. All right. So to take apart this and be able to go into this point by point, almost like a rebuttal, point by point. The first point is concerning Exodus. Exodus is not found in the text of the Bible. Exodus, the word Exodus only appears in the title of the second book. The phrase Exodus is actually a Greek, is actually a Greek phrase for going out. So Exodus basically means going out. And when the Hebrew scroll was translated into the Potomi, the Potomi time, right, in Alexandria time, when it was translated into the Koina, the common language, it's almost like the Bible we have, KJV. It says in this opening, in this opening area, let's just get this right here. It says in the opening area, many of you all maybe, maybe had read this, right? It says translated out of these ancient languages. Some of the Bibles don't have that there, but the very old 1611 King James Version basically has that there. Right, so when you look at the old 1611, the 1611, 1611, the one that has the old English, it basically says translated out of, you know, the the ancient original, the original languages and everything. Right, so the word Exodus is a Greek word, and since the text of the Old Testament is reference to Hebrew text and Masoretic text you would not find that particular word in the text. What you would find is a phrase. The key phrase is out of Egypt or out from Egypt. Out of Egypt to say the yetziat, to yetzah, yetzah, tzah, tzah in the Hebrew, going out, yetziat, mimitzrai, the coming out or the going out of Egypt. And now later, the title the Greek word was adopted into English circa 1611, around about them times, right? In the Hebrew Bible, the book of Exodus that's called Exodus is called Shemot. Shemot. And Shemot means names, right? And this follows the ancient custom and tradition of naming a book according to its first significant words, like the Torah portions. The Torah portions usually are based on the significant word, right? The significant word in that passage that begins that reading for that Torah portion, for that Shabuah, for that seven days, right? Now, what does the word Shemot mean? It means names. It means names. It's from the singular, right? That's a plural form. And the singular Hebrew is Shem, is Shem. It's pointing as Shem. The book of Exodus, it begins, the Ele Shemot, with Ele Shemot. It begins, and these, right, and these are the names. That's how the book of Exodus begins in the Hebrew. With Ele, with and Ele, these Shemot. And these, the names. The names of who? The names of the B'nai the Bane, the Bene Yisrael, the names of the sons, the children of Israel. Hashem, when we say Hashem, that's to say the name to speak of what one's always called God or the power of Israel. Ha'el, Ha'el, Ha'el Elohim, Ha'elohim calls each person by name to make the journey. Ha'elohim also, according to the, the, the scriptures, calls each star by its own name. So this link with names is significant for us who have faith in the narrative and study the narrative of the scripture of the Bible. So the word Exodus, we just proved right here that Exodus does not appear anywhere in the text. That's what we're emphasizing, anywhere in the text of the Bible. Instead, what you would find is the phrase out of Egypt, out of Egypt. So is it the Exodus or is it out of Egypt? So Garfield says and has said repeatedly in the various different interviews and videos promoting his, um, his new book, he says that the Exodus never happened. 
and he says one of the books that he focuses on in the Bible is Chronicles. And based on the Chronicles narrative, he says that they don't even mention the Exodus. Now, if he's saying the word Exodus, we just showed you that the word doesn't appear anywhere in the text. It only appears in the title of the second book. And the word Exodus is basically the way the Greek word sounds based on the Septuagint, and that was adopted. So when the King James Version of the Bible translators translate it, they use some phrases from the LXX, from the Greek, the Koine Greek, the Common Greek. They use the majority of verse translations from the Hebrew, the Masoretic Hebrew. So when we're reading this, we need to kind of understand what, how it was translated into English. But now to counter his point that Chronicles, right, does not mention the Exodus, we'll say this. Okay, you're right. The Exodus is nowhere mentioned in the text of the Bible. The only place the Exodus is mentioned is in the title of the second book. Why? Because exodus is a Greek phrase. Exodus is a Greek phrase. Hebraically, we call the book the Sefer Yetziat Mimitzrai, the book of the going out from Egypt, the going out of Egypt, or it is known more commonly Hebraically, Judaically, among Hebrew speaking and studying Israelites, it's known as Shemot. Shemot, because of the key word, the distinctive, the distinctive word found in the Hebrew, Shemot. We'ele Shemot, and these Shemot, and these are the names. So we give him that point. That point there is well taken. It's not just Chronicles, but nowhere else in the Bible would you find the phrase Exodus in the KJV, the 400-year Bible. We're not talking about these other later Bibles over the last maybe 20, 30 or so years. These NIV, NSV, and all this, and this and that. The NKJV, not even that either. All right? We're talking about the 1611, the Bible that was the standing point of reference for this Western Gentile world. Right? Okay, so now, as far as if Garfield's point is that Chronicles does not make any mention of coming out of Egypt, well, he's lying to you. He, he, is, he is in great error, and if we can use the phrase, he's lying. He's lying about that. Whether he knows he's lying or not, I don't know what the man knows. I don't know what he knows. Right? But I know what he says. He says that, well, Acts does not mention the Bible to imply that in Chronicles, they don't even talk about coming out of Egypt. And when I heard him say this, I heard him say it a few times, when I heard him say this most recently, I looked up Passover. I looked up Passover, and I focused on whether Passover is mentioned in Chronicles. Because if Passover is mentioned in Chronicles, then the Hebrews and the Israelites are referring, my people, our people, I and I people, are referring to the ex what's called the exodus remember exodus is a greek is a greek word uh, i i should have brought it up here but i don't have this i have this in uh, in, in in paper in the text right here but don't have it as a um as a slide right now to show you but you can look that up exodus what is exodus exodus is a greek phrase exodus is a greek phrase and that Greek phrase was to describe the way the Hebrews, because it was Hebrews and Israelites who translated the Hebrew scripture into Greek. It was not the Greeks who wrote it. This is what ones like Garfield and others are trying to imply, right? You know, but that's not being very, that's being disingenuous. But here, let's go to this verse here. Let's prove that out of Egypt and the Exodus or the coming out of Egypt is referred to in Chronicles. Here we have 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 21. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people Israel, whom God went to redeem, to be his own people, to make thee a name of greatness and terribleness by driving out nations from before thy people, whom thou hast redeemed. You see that right there? Who thou hast redeemed out of Mitzrayim. Who thou hast redeemed, me Mitzrayim. Now, if we need to get into the, the Hebrew right here, let's just go right here for a moment and see what it says right there. Let's go down to the Tanakh right down here. Okay, 
here it goes right here. The Tanakh is a little further down here because we have different versions open. I like to study different versions and see and compare and contrast. This is Asher Padita. Asher Padita Mimitz Rai Goyi. Right? A people redeemed, that, that which he has redeemed, Mimitz Rai, out of Egypt. So the Mimitz Rai, which is this word right here, right? It has a preposition, the main, the, the M, and then it has the noun Mitzrayi, reading from right to left. Mi Mitzrayi means from Egypt, or in translation, out of Egypt. Asher, that which who padita, that which the I redeem, Mi Mitzrayi from Egypt. So right there, we are looking at Chronicles and Chronicles, first mention of Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles 1 and 16, it says, And Shlomo, um, Solomon, Solomon had horses brought me Mitzrayim out of Egypt. So here, in this one, this is clearly speaking to the Exodus. So the writers of Chronicles clearly refer to the Exodus. How do we prove that Chronicles in the Bible that Garfield uses as his main reference to disprove the Exodus? ever happen the coming out of Egypt of the Hebrews and the children of Israel happen he can't use Chronicles to prove that because here this one verse right here is the disproof of that right this this is what checks that madness that modernness right so here it talks about Solomon getting horses out of Egypt now of course it's not talking about the Exodus horses but later on he got horses from Egypt the other quote basically says that the other quote basically is quoting that the Israelites came out of Egypt. That that Jah Jehovah Yahweh Eloheinu Hakadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem that the Holy One blessed be He blessed be His name redeemed this people. So we have the witness in Chronicles. Chronicles here's the verse right here. Chronicles chapter 17, verse 21 proves that. Right, talking about Israel taking Israel out of Egypt. That is effectively what you would call the Exodus, right? So here it talks about bringing horses out of Egypt. That's during the time of Solomon, right? Here, we have Second Chronicles 5 and 10, the second proof. There was nothing in the ark save the two tablets which Moshe, Moses put therein at Horeb, at Horeb or Horeb, right? Horeb. When Yahweh, when Jehovah made a covenant with the Bnei Yisrael, with the sons of Israel. When they came, me meets Raim. Look at this right here. The word came is Yatsa. Yatsa. Yatsa is the Hebrew word for Exodus. Yatsa. Yatsa. How do we know this? Go out. Come out to exit. Exit. Exodus. Exodus. To go forth to come out of Egypt. So if he's trying to say that his book using chronicles this proves that the exodus ever happened because chronicles does not mention the going forth or the coming out of egypt of the hebrews or the israelites well we have so far right now we have two verses that disproves that right the children of israel when they did what came out now here we have let's look at the hebrew right here here we have in the hebrew let's go down to the to the Tanakh, right? Here we have in Hebrew, we have, um, it says right here, B'nai, Im B'nai Yisrael. Here, let's, let's just highlight the part that we're going to zoom in on. It says, B'tz'eitam. B'tz'eitam. B'tz'eitam mi mitzrayim. Remember, we said that the Hebrew book, Sefer Yetziyat, Yetziyat mitzrayim. Here it says, B'tz'eitam. Tom, bits a atom, bits a atom, me meets rai, bits a atom, me meets rai, and bringing them out, say atom, say at, say at is exodus in the Hebrew, bits a atom, um, them, me from meets rai. So here in Second Chronicles 5 and 10. So we have two proofs, they said two or three witnesses, or we say. Not they say, we say, because remember, we're the ones who have faith, you know, or, or believe, as they would say, in the Bible. Uh-oh, 
2 Chronicles 6 and 5, since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt. So here in 2 Chronicles 6 and 5, we have the third verse that says that, according to Chronicles, the same book that Garfield, in his book, is saying they never mention the Exodus. Well, they're mentioning the Exodus right here. Now, the word Exodus, once again, is only a Greek title word that's used for the second book of the translation. But if we're speaking about the Israelites saying in Chronicles that they came, the ancestors came out of Egypt, well, they say it in, so far, this is the third place. Since the day that I brought forth my people, ah me, out of the land of Egypt, boom, need we bring up the H776, the Eretz, why he brought them, me, you know, me Eretz, me Eretz uh, Mitzrayim, from the Eretz, from the land. So that means they were there and they were brought out. I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build and house in that my name, Shemi, might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over Ami Israel, over my people Israel. Uh-oh, uh-oh, 2 Chronicles 7.22. This is the fourth place. Keep count. Check. Note. And it shall be answered because they forsook Yahuwah, the Elohe of Abotam, of their fathers, their patriarchs, who brought them forth. Uh-oh. Whenever it says forth, Yatsa, Yatsa, Yatsiat, right, who brought them out of. See, if they were translating this all from Greek, it was, says, who brought them or made them exodus, made them exit, exit, out of the land of Egypt. Mi Mitzrayim, Mi Eretz Mitzrayim. And laid hold on other gods, other Elohim, other people's powers, other people's God constructs, and worship them and serve them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. All right. Uh-oh, the fifth place. Is it the fifth place? Oh, that's the Solomon bringing horses. We will dismiss this because it's talking about Solomon nearly more than like 400, according to the scripture, nearly 400 years after the Exodus. All right? So we're going to dismiss this because it's talking about the time of Solomon. And it's just talking about Solomon got horses. All right? Here, out of Egypt, it's talking about Jeroboam. That's one who lived in the time of Solomon. So we would like to, you know, we seek to be right, and it says, Tzedek, Tzedek Terdof, justice, justice, shalt thou pursue, shalt thou follow. So our scripture tells us to do things justly. So we're not going to just throw that in because it's out of Egypt, but the ones that specifically speak about the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel coming out of Egypt, so far in the book of Chronicles, are four. We, we count it at four. The rest of these right here, who came with him, let's see, that came with him, out of Egypt, the Lubim, Sukim, and the Ethiopians. Okay, let's go on. All right, but this is talking about a later time. When they look, this is the fifth place. The fifth place. And, and we're looking at out of Egypt in connection with the narrative of the first five books of the Bible, particularly with the narrative of the second book that's called Exodus. In Second Chronicles 2010. 2010. It says, And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade, when they came, uh oh, out of the land, me Eretz Mitzrayim. You see, these monolingual scholars, these one language scholars, I, I don't know if I would even call them scholars. I guess they are scholars, but they, they have to be, you have to give them the title monolingual. Monolingual. That means they're relying on the translation while we can check the translator, see if the translation is correct or see if they might have made an inadvertent or an intentional error. Here it says, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. This basically is regurgitating what was already written in the earlier books ascribed to Moshe, Moshe Robeno, ascribed to Moses, our teacher. All right? Here, here, here. So we have five places. Was that five places? I'm going to have to go over this again. There's five places. Five places. We 
Well, I would say we plead the fifth, but that might be construed in the Western Gentile sense of pleading in the fifth. You know what I mean? But we have five places. There are five places. Count it five places. There are five places within Chronicles, the very book that Garfield says in his book and the different interviews here and there. All right, let's just get this right here. Let me just drop something. Okay, yeah. There are five places in Chronicles. There are five places in Chronicles that all speak about the Exodus. Now, to top it off, that's just the cake right there. Let's put the icing on the cake. Let's look up Passover. And let's zoom in on Chronicles. All right, boom, look at that. Passover, all right, in Chronicles. In fact, our search is just for Chronicles. We're just searching Chronicles. Just to make that note. Mm -hmm. We're searching Chronicles. All right. In Chronicles, Passover is mentioned. Let's see how many times it's passed. 17 times? Is Passover mentioned 17 times? So what do you think Passover is about? See, a lot of Western Gentile, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant Christians, whether black or white, they... Well, Christians, some Christians might know, some Christians might not know, right? But what do we as Yehudi do and say during Passover? What is Passover all about? Passover is all about the exodus that Jehovah, right, that, that the, the Almighty, right, that Hashem did for our people, our ancestors, when he brought them, me meets Ra'in, when he caused them to come out of Egypt. So... They're talking about Passover here, to keep the Passover to Jehovah, the power of Israel. Here it's talking about to keep the Passover in the second month, the second moon. How would they know to keep the Passover in the second month, the second moon? Because that's found in the five books that are ascribed to Moses. So this lie that, well, it was Chronicles, like, like the, the, their lie is that, well, Chronicles was the only thing they had, and then they kind of reverse engineered from Chronicles all these other books. That's just, for, for, for academic and scholarly, you know, it's called an academic, that's really stupid. That's really stupid, right? That's idiotes. Another scholarly phrase, that's idiotes, right? Look right here, to keep the Passover to the Lord. Right? They killed the Passover on the 14th day. How do you know what day to kill the Passover on the second month? Why did they do it in the second month? Right? Because that's what the Torah says. That's what the five books of Moses says. Here it's talking about that before the Levites, therefore the Levites had the charge of killing the Passovers. I'm talking about the lambs and everything. What does it bring out right here? The Pesach, which is the Passover lamb, the Pascal lamb. Right here, it's talking about the tribes right here. Right? Had not cleaned themselves. Yet they did eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. So, look, wait, wait, hold on for a moment. How could they eat the Passover otherwise than what was written? What was written in the Chronicles or what was written in the former scrolls? See, you have to remember that the Israelites were only in Babylon. And this is a historical fact, right? I mean, not the Israelites. Well, they're Israelites, but more specifically the Judahites. Right, because of the separation of the kingdom, the upper and the lower kingdom, the Jews, the black Jews, the Yehudi, the Yehudim, they were in is they was they, they was in um what you call it, Babylon for seventy years. This is a historical fact. There's other corresponding facts from other nations that also prove this. But here it says that these tribes had not cleansed themselves, yet they did eat the Passover otherwise than it was written. Written where, where acts and where was it written? You know, like, like, you know, with those people who just don't, I don't want to say even believe the Bible, but have a, have a, 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 what does it say, like have a, have a vengeance, not a vengeance, they have this like um, a grudge or something like that against those who do believe in the Bible because they feel that it's no good for us. They feel that it's like white man stuff or something like that. Okay, well, your translation, the translations may be, but there's deeper roots to that. You know, and, and we still haven't forgotten what he has misrepresented concerning the Ethiopian scrolls and manuscripts. We'll get to that, right? But it says, the good Lord pardoned everyone, right? right? That's why Hezekiah prayed for them, because they did something not according to what was written. Moreover, Josiah kept the Passover to Yahuwah in Yerushalayim and killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. So there's a first month and second month. How do we know that there can be a first month and a second month? Is it because of what's written in the Torah or the five books of Pentateuch? 
right? And they knew it too. These who had returned from the Babylonian captivity after 70 years, they're the writers of chronicles. They wrote their chronicles, like a narration of their history as they recall, as they knew it, as they put it together, right? But there's those who try to say, well, that's the only thing, this is the only book that is real. The rest of it was made up afterward. But the narrative of this book, it dismisses that. It's like they are writing about things that already was written about before, and they are clarifying it for their people, right? They are basically de declaring it to their generation that had just returned. It was like a, a point of reference document for those who had returned and also a warning so that they would not do that which would cause them to be um, eligible or vulnerable to a second diaspora or dispersion among the foreigners. So kill the Passover and sanctify yourselves. Okay, right? And prepare your brethren that they may do according to the word of Yahuwah by the hand of Moses. So they're saying that all of these ancient peoples, obviously he must agree that, well, maybe this part is somewhat true, right? Or at least this part was written by ones who really were Jews or Judahites, right? They clearly are stating their re reference, their point of reference, the, the sources that they are referring to as Moses. So what he's trying to do is dismiss the sources even of the source or reference he is pointing to even refers to the same sources that he's dismissive of but he'll use those sources to try to say something else about the whole thing it just doesn't you can't use the same source if you say that this witness is a true witness because they testify to what you want them to say or they say something that goes with your opinion if somebody else goes to that same source or or resource and then finds evidence from that same witness that can dismiss your argument, you got to take it. You got to take it. And Josiah gave to the people of the flock, the lamb, the kids, all the Passover. So Josiah is doing the Passover, right? And right here. And the princes gave willingly to the people, to the priests, and to the Levites, Hilkiah, and Zechariah, and Jehiel, Yehiel, rulers of the house of Elohim, of Hilehim, gave to the priests for. Passover, Pesach offerings, 2,600 small cattle and 300 oxen. You know the interesting thing is, all these guys nowadays try to dismiss the verity of what the Bible says. And there were many ancient peoples who knew of these people at those ancient times and many archaeological evidence that proves that. And they didn't even dismiss that what the children of Israel said in their testimony was false. They just said that they didn't like it and, and that that wasn't for them. It's not their God and up what you believe. But they didn't even try to do what you guys are doing now and not that successfully. See, that's why we warned some of the Hebrews and the Israelites. Yes, yeah, Sarnet is right about that. Why you are like cursing out the sister and all of this, and you know, and then your own Bible tells you that there is a discipline that is necessary. But here it says, gave to the Levites for Passover offering. Boom. We could go through all this if, if need be. They killed the Passover. Okay, boom. Here. Then we see the Passover here, right? The Passover is mentioned here, right? The service of Jehovah was prepared the same day to keep the Passover. Right, and then down here, the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at the time and the feast of unleavened bread seven days. Where did they get this from? They got that from the earlier scrolls, right? And there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Shemuel, the days of Samuel the prophet, Shemuel Hanabi. Neither, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Uzziah. Josiah kept and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, if you want to criticize us or our ancestors as Israelites, is that no, we always did not do that which was written. But then to say that that which was written was not written, you know, or, or to assume these assumptions because you are following the consensus of some latter day white Anglo-Saxon Protestant scholars, right, who see what black people have discovered the half of the story that hasn't been told. And now you're, you guys are being like Sanballat and Tobiah, right? Now the name Tobiah, there's a good Tobiah and there's, you know, I have a brother named Tobiah, but there was a particular Tobiah 
and they were those who were starting to oppose right that rebuilding of the exiles and this is like what you're doing you're in that same position and even Sarnetta as Sanbalat and Tobiah right we need to touch on that in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was the Passover capped so here we have how many verses 17 verses 17 verses just in Chronicles that speak about the Passover and the Passover commemorates when the, their ancestors and our ancestors came out of Egypt so we prove to you that both we have coming out how Jehovah the the Elohim the Hilahim the power of Israel El Elohe Yisrael as we say El Elohe Yisrael I mean some of the stuff is so foolish he even tried to say like you know Yahweh or Yod Hey Wah Hey Whites W H or Jehovah is different than Elohim. This is some craziness. He tried to say that Jehovah or Yahweh is an Edomite God, you know, and that the Israelites got it from the you you just sick in the head. You really have a grudge. You know, Manafik. We call it Manafik, right? Manafikun. Right? But anyway, be that as it may. This video a little bit longer than we intended probably try to do a couple of summary short videos just to like circle the wagons on certain points right here did the exodus ever happen the exodus you mean Jehovah bringing the children of Israel just speaking basic English bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt by the hand of Moses by the hand of Moshe did that happen Yes, according to the scripture, according to the Bible, and also according to true archaeology and true academic scholarly research. It doesn't matter whether ones are Bible believers. It's like he's trying to dismiss the belief of those who believe in the Bible by bringing some, some, some ones and ones that on a certain level are kooks. You know, they, they, they could be very academic, very scholarly, so forth and so on, but we, we don't have to agree with them. I'm sure a lot of other academics don't agree with them. So here to the Exodus point, as well as to the Chronicle point, because he says there's no Exodus in Chronicles. Well, I agree with you if you're going to say the word Exodus, because the word Exodus, as we've been stating over, and just one more time here again, the word Chronicles, I mean the word Exodus, right, doesn't appear not just in Chronicles, but nowhere else in the text. In the text, I'm emphasizing that, right, for some who may be slow on slow gases, right, in the text, in the text of the Bible. Because why? Especially the Old Testament, it's a Greek word. It's a coin of Greek word. The phrase that is used is out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, when Jah Jehovah or translator call it the Lord, when the Lord brought out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt. And we just went through the verses right here. Please go through these verses, get a good software so you can search those things and go through it one by one, you know, if you will. But basically, um, still, in spite of knowing what we know, that we can already see that what he shared concerning his book, right, is already faulty. Faulty just in the basic. We're not going into what the scholars say. We like to see what the academics say, what references they are using, and how verifiable, and we got to vet those scholars and vet the book. But what he has already gone on the record to say that the Exodus never happened, he said the Rasta, some of his Rasta Jamaican brothers, maybe the Jamaican Rastafari, the Benjamite Rastafari may be upset. I and I as a Judahite, we're not, we're not upset with you. In fact, this is like light work. This is easy work. This is very light work right here. You know what I mean? We didn't even have to read your book just yet because you already went on the record saying that the Exodus never happened and the Exodus is not mentioned in Chronicles and there was no such thing in the Exodus and they didn't even mention anything about coming out of Egypt or nothing like that in the book of Chronicles. Well, we proved here on the record with some basic, basic, basic biblical, right? Basic biblical research, right? Let's go here and just do this right here just for a full transparency, right? Let's go right here. Let's do this right here. See, we're looking, we're looking up in Chronicles. Let's look up in the whole Bible, right? The whole Bible, right? We just zoomed in on Chronicles. Since one is saying that, well, it's this book they're using, well, let's look at that book. Let's change this up right here, and let's put Exodus here. Let's see if Exodus occurs anywhere in the Bible, right? Boom. Exodus doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible. 
Exodus doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible. Exodus in the text, in the text of the Bible. Exodus only occurs as the translated 1611 title. So Exodus as a phrase got into the parlance of you know, Bible studies and all of that and this because of the 1611 Bible. All right? All right, so this is Ras Iadonis Tafari, L-O-J-S dot O-R-G, the Lion of Judah Society. And you could play with the name if you want, to, like you did with our brother Zion Lex. You call him Lion, lying like he's a liar or something like that. Yo, that's not kosher. But then again, you're not kosher either. You know what I mean? But be it as it may, we still are going to cop a copy of your book, right, to see what more. And we're already getting some of our fellow scribes together because you use a lot of academic, scholarly people. You know, you even said in some of your videos to look over, proofread your book and, and really help you get up your weight and everything. So we're going to seek to do the same thing to respond to your book. You know what I mean? But first thing first, we respond to your your lies, your lies and your errors, right? About the Exodus never happened and how it's not mentioned in Chronicles. We use the proof of Passover. Passover is all about the Exodus. Pesach, that's all it talks about. That's, that's the very epicenter of it. And this is why Garfield went after that particular point because, you know, I guess his counsel or those who he have, some of the Gentiles that are on his side, you know, basically you know, figure out how can we defeat them, right? How can we defeat them? Well, we're going to defeat the whole exodus, the whole exodus narrative. All right? Aight? Aight.